Welcome to today's special edition of Go Beyond with Pastor Michael Eurisha. Michael is an international speaker, songwriter, and the senior pastor of the Judah Ministries International Worship Center, located in McKeesport, Pennsylvania. If you are ever in the greater Pittsburgh area, be sure to come and visit us. For more information about our ministry, please feel free to visit our website at www.judahministries.net. Here's Pastor Michael. Well, listen, Judah, this morning, first of all, pray for me. <laughs> I'm really struggling with these allergies the last couple of weeks, and it's nothing new. I go through it every year. So we have a lot to get through, so just pray that the Lord would sustain my voice. Amen. Amen. Now, last week was a pretty hard-hitting rough message and hope by now it's digested by everyone. <laughs> Listen, that, that's not easy preaching. I take no pleasure, but my mandate is to speak the truth of the Word of God. How many of you know speaking truth is love? Amen. That I love you enough to speak truth to you. might hurt your feelings. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Might upset your apple cart a little bit, but truth is good. As I told the men's, we had a global men's conference the other day. I, I told the brothers, I says, listen, man, truth is not tolerant. One plus one is two. I don't care how you feel. I don't care what you think. One plus one is two. Well, I think it's three. Well... If the engineers built bridges on one plus one equal three, how many bridges would you feel safe on? You know why? Because the foundation would be off. I think I said something there. And here's the other thing. One plus one is two in America, Australia. Upper class, lower class, middle class, don't matter what side of the tracks you're on. No matter what culture you're a part of, come on, Judah, one plus one is what? Two. It's two. Thank you. You got it. Amen. Let's get into the message. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. All right. <clears throat> now, before we get into Daniel, as you know by now, we've been studying the book of Daniel. Today, we're getting into Daniel chapter 6. Now, this is just a reminder that the sixth chapter of Daniel is the last historical chapter of the book of Daniel. The da book of Daniel is basically divided into two sections. Chapters 1 through 6 is mostly historical. 7 through 12 is mostly prophetic. So beginning next week, we will begin to decipher Daniel's visions, the dreams, and it's amazing, amazing the accuracy of these 2,600-year-old prophecies. So as we enter into chapter 6, we now move into the reign of the Medo-Persian Empire, which fulfilled the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had way back in chapter 2 about the gold head, the silver breast with the two arms. So the Babylonian Empire in chapter 6 has now been overthrown. Belshazzar was killed, just as Daniel said, as he interpreted the handwriting on the wall, if you remember from last week's message. So Darius the Mede is now the reigning king. He's now the reigning king. So just a quick review. Our main characters throughout the book of Daniel uh, thus far was Daniel, uh, King Darius, and the crooked politicians. Amen? Amen. Did, did y'all think crooked politicians just began like, in America, y'all? Come on, y'all. Trust me, we do not own the trademark on crooked politicians. <laughs> So our main characters here in this chapter will be Daniel, King Darius, and some crooked politicians. Now, chapter 1, Judah's besieged in 605 B.C. 
The four Hebrew boys are taken captive. They're transported to Babylon. They were indoctrinated in the Babylonian University. In chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has the dream about the giant statue with the head of gold, breastplate and arms of silver, the legs of brass, uh, I'm sorry, the belly of brass, the legs of iron, and the feet mixed with iron and clay, which is a kingdom yet to come. In chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar builds a massive statue, which is 60 cubits by 6 cubits by 6 cubits, 666. Somebody say 666. It's the number of man, and we're going to see the parallels in the book of Revelation through the book of Daniel. So he required everyone to worship it. However, the three Hebrew boys refused, and they found themselves in a fiery, like we said last week, fiery service. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> They were in the fiery furnace with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Chapter 4, there was a giant tree. Nebuchadnezzar had a, a dream. This wicked Gentile king, we see him coming to faith in the God of the Hebrews after spending seven years of eating grass like an ox. In this chapter, uh, chapter 5, we see the tremendous patience and grace and mercy of a loving God who wishes that none would perish. None would perish, but all would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, that was chapter 4. Chapter 5, Belshazzar, Belshazzar throws a huge party and outrightly mocks God by drinking out of the sacred cups from Jerusalem. God said, enough is enough. Enough is enough. In other words, the handwriting was on the wall. And God judged Babylon. And we looked at so many parallels as with the United States of America today as we are now drinking out of the golden cups and just basically, let me just speak in layman's terms here, we're basically just giving God the finger. Unfortunately, there's a lot of churches that are doing it as well. So moving into chapter 6, once again, the Medes and the Persians overthrow Babylon, and Darius is now the king. The year is around 522 B.C. So Daniel, in this chapter, is in his late 80s, maybe even his early 90s. So he is an elderly gentleman. So here we are, Daniel chapter 6. We're going to begin reading right at verse 1. Let's pray. Our Father, in the matchless holy name of Jesus... Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that your word would go forth in power and in might, Father God, and change hearts, Father God. Change us. Transform us even into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, Father God. Till up the soil in our hearts that we might receive from your Holy Spirit this day, Father God. In the matchless holy name of Jesus, we pray. All Judah shouted, Amen. Amen. Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. The Bible says it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of them whom was Daniel. The satraps were accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. In other words, they were looking over his affairs. Number uh, Verse 3. Now Daniel distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities. It says in the New International Version, if you look this up in the King James Version, it says that he had an excellent spirit. It was in him. And if you look that up in the Hebrew, it's rock, rock, spirit. We, some of us who study the Hebrew a little bit, rock, hakodesh, is the Holy Spirit. So the Bible says he had a excellent rock, spirit within him, that the king, because of this, the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. So because of his excellent spirit, Darius was going to promote him even above, listen, the other two administrators. So I want to talk to you this morning a little bit about having an excellent spirit within us. First off, let me say, just because you have the spirit of God within you doesn't make you have an excellent spirit. Hmm. 
There's a whole lot of people with the Spirit of God within them that are still lazy. Uh huh. Laziness is not an excellent spirit. Does somebody hear what I'm saying? There's a whole lot of people that have the Spirit of God within them that are still rude when speaking to others. <laughs> Uh, we might need to pass out some band-aids after this service, I think, huh? <laughs> so listen, Judah, what, what I'm trying to say here is just because you're born again doesn't make you have an excellent spirit. You all hear what I'm saying? Somebody say amen. amen. So what is an excellent spirit? All right, let's, let's take a spirit checkup, if you will. Now, an excellent spirit, listen, it's applicable to every facet of your life. Your workplace, as it was with Daniel. Remember, Daniel isn't serving in the ministry. He's serving in the government. He's in the inner cabinet. He's been there for decades, right? So he had an excellent spirit. You can have an excellent spirit in the ministry. You could have an excellent spirit at home and life in general. So this teaching is a very practical teaching for you. So I think we have a slide here. If you could put that up. A person with an excellent spirit is, first of all, their faithful faithful it means you show up all the time on time now i'm not just talking about church y'all for period thank you for your job you don't show up whenever you feel like it amen you don't just leave whenever you feel like it amen how many of you know that'll get you the left foot of fellowship pretty quick right so a faithful person that's why the bible says a faithful people are hard to find. That's why the Bible asks the rhetorical question, a faithful man, who can find? They're few and far between. So having a faithful, being faithful is having an excellent spirit. Number two, a person with an excellent spirit is motivated. They're not lazy. Wow, that lazy thing, he just keeps, he keeps hitting some folk in here. When somebody gives you a task, you're on it. You don't procrastinate. You don't have to be reminded. Someone always doesn't have to be looking over your shoulder. You do what needs to be done. You don't wait for the other guy to do it. Come on, do I got a witness in this house? Y'all know what I'm talking about here. Come on, help the preacher out this morning a little bit. Number three, a person with an excellent spirit doesn't complain or murmur. Huh. They don't complain about a task, but they go above and beyond the call of duty, and they're glad to do it. Psalm 100 says, worship the Lord with gladness. Well, that word worship is also translated as serve. So not only do we worship the Lord with gladness, but we serve in whatever capacity that we're engaged in. We serve the Lord with gladness. Gladness. In other words, when you're walking around a church, you see a piece of paper on the floor, please don't wait for somebody else to pick it up. Then they complain that nobody else does it. As spirit-filled Christians, we should do whatever we have before us and do it with joy. And don't worry about what the other guy is or is not doing. Are you hearing me? They don't have to answer for you. You don't have to answer for them. Be faithful. Be motivated. Don't complain. Number four, an excellent spirit prepares. To use a sports analogy, you can't just show up on a Sunday at game time and just play the game. No, you have to practice. You have to study the week before. You have to have preparation. Think about it this way in corporate America. If you're the CFO, the chief financial officer of an organization and you have a board meeting to go to and you just show up without a financial report and you just say, well, I'm just going to be led by the Spirit. <laughs> Once again, you're getting that left foot of fellowship. Come on, you all know what I'm talking about. Come on, that's silly. But in the ministry church, it's the same way. It'd be like coming to church on a Sunday with no preparation, no study, no anything. Just come here and just show up. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I've been in some services like that, led by the Spirit. No, they were chaotic. 
people not showing up on time, guest speakers were supposed to be there, they're a half an hour late. Come on, y'all. Do I get a witness in this house? Singers don't even show. They don't even call. They don't even send a text. I'm not going to make it today. Oh, but we were led by the Spirit. No, that was chaos. Our Bible says that God does everything decent. Come on, help me. And in order. Good Bible students you are. But people want to blame that, you know, on led by the Spirit. No, you, you're not ready. Number five. A person with an excellent spirit is consistent. In other words, as a manager, you can depend on the person to always be there and always be productive. They might not be the exact best at what they do. They might not be the superstar of the team, but you can always count on their work. Y'all with me? Listen, as a business owner in years past and as a pastor, I would much rather have five committed people, five consistent people that I can count on to do whatever, then have five superstars that I don't ever know if they're going to show up or not. So you have to be consistent. Number six, a person with an excellent spirit is polite. Somebody say polite. polite. What does it cost you to be polite to somebody? It doesn't cost you anything to be cordial. You don't have to be bossing everybody around. Know how to properly communicate. That's a godly gift. But it can be learned. I, you know, I'm so sick and tired. Well, that's just the way I am. Well, change. <laughs> that's the way I was brought up. And I, I get those genes from my mother, from my dad, from my grandmother. Well, listen, if you're born again, bro, you got new genes in you. Come on, church. There's another spirit working inside there. Quit blaming it on your mammy. Oh, Jesus. You know how to properly communicate. For example, let me give you just a simple example here. Watch. If I, if, if I said, Pastor Lise, can you please get me a drink of water? No, I'm not really mean that, although I could probably use one. Of, of the, all right, but that's one way of communicating. Or so I said, go get me a glass of water. I communicated the same exact thing. Do you see the difference? Godly people know how to communicate. If you want somebody or you need somebody to do something, ask them. Don't tell them. You catch a whole lot more flies with honey than vinegar. Y'all with me? Number seven. This is good. Listen. And this is one of our foundations here at Judah. A person with an excellent spirit promotes unity. They know how to get along and work with a team. Right? The acronym for team is T-E-A-M. Together, everyone achieves more. The Bible's full of unity. And no, your way is not always the right way. And it's not always the best way. <laughs> it might be best for you, but it's not best for me. If, if I ask my children to do something and they figure out a better way to do it or an easier way, that's do it your way. Who was it? Burger King? Have it your way. They don't always have to do it your way. Your way is not, my way is not always the best way. We've got to be open to hear other people's opinions. Now, if I'm the manager, now, if I don't take your opinion or your, your way, well, then you just got to sit down. <laughs> you know, you just got to realize that I'm the one that's responsible for making that decision. That's all. We got to build unity. A spirit of excellence brings out the best in other and builds unity. It's not divisive. Number eight. A person with an excellent spirit is always trying to better themselves at whatever gifting or vocation you have. How many of you know the Bible says that all gifts are given from the Father of heavenly lights? No matter what gift you have, my sister or my brother, no matter what it is, it's been given to you by the Father above. Now it's up to us to develop. Y'all with me? It's up to us to culture that gifting. Hey, you know, he can bless you with a musical gift, but honey, if you don't sit at the keyboard for five, six hours a day and practice, 
You think Mozart just all, all of a sudden one day was, of course, it's silly to think that. So whatever gift it is you've given, and everybody, look at your neighbor, see, he's talking to you. You've been given a gift, so it's up to us to, 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 to culture it and make it better. And it's up to us, listen, not only that, but you might be, now I know you heard me, but it's apropos. There's a whole lot of Christian folks sitting on their assets. You know what I'm talking about? Right? You got a gift, but you ain't doing nothing with it. Yeah. Now watch this now. Okay, watch this, because here, here's where some people get attitude. Matthew 25, Jesus is teaching the parable of the talents. He gave 110, 15, 1, 1. When they come back, the one did nothing with it. He was lazy. As a matter of fact, Jesus said he was a wicked servant. So laziness brings wickedness with it. Y'all with me? Somebody say amen. amen. All right. So Jesus said, give me that talent off of that one and give it to the other one. So listen, if you have a talent and you're not stepping up, then all of a sudden God brings somebody else into the fellowship and steps into your position. Now you get an attitude. Thank you. Bless you. I'm fading fast. I don't know if we're going to get through this, but we're going to try. Somebody say amen. amen. So y'all yo, yo, yo with me? So, so don't get upset if, if, if somebody comes into the fellowship and takes your position because you weren't prepared. You're not doing what you need to do. And, and then God replaces you. That's a biblical principle, y'all. Number nine. A person with an excellent spirit is humble. They're not bodacious. They're not a glory hound. You don't need accolades from everybody. You always don't need the attaboy. You don't troll for compliments. Y'all know what I mean by trolling for compliments? How, how many you might know somebody like that, you know? As soon as they're done singing that song, they come over to you. Did you like my song? <laughs> now, if you're that bodacious to ask that question... You know, I'm, I'm an audio engineer and a music producer from years back, and I hear a lot of things that people don't hear that aren't good, amen? So I said, no, you was flat all over the place, your words. <laughs> so if you want to ask the question, are you prepared for a truthful answer, or do you just want somebody to stroke your ego? I'm trying to help somebody this morning. Y'all with me? <laughs> but people d d doing that all, all the time just... Looking, you know, oh, didn't that song bless you? The Bible says, watch this. Proverbs 27 and 2 says, let another praise you. You might be at the best whatever you do, but remain humble. Remain gracious in winning and in losing. I want to sh share a, a, a family testimony. I know my family always starts squirming right about now. <laughs> But, it, but it's all good. It's all good. Many of you know because you follow us on Facebook that our, our youngest son is quite the soccer player. He, he really is, and I'm not saying that because he, he's our child. I mean, coaches say it, colleges say it, um, you know, uh, the newspapers say it. You know, he's got the statistics to back it up. So it's not uh, just because, okay, so he's always, wherever we go, always one of the best players. So we're at a, a match one time. I don't even remember where this was. I think it was out in Virginia or somewhere where they were playing. And he's a very physical player. For those of you who aren't familiar with soccer, it's a very physical game. So there's a 50-50 ball, and him and another young guy go in, and Caleb gets position on him and just lays this kid out. <laughs> you know, he's laying on the ground. The ball goes up the other field. They don't blow the whistle in soccer. You just keep playing unless somebody's really hurt. So... The ball goes up. Instead of Caleb running back up into the play to help his team try to score, he goes and tends to that kid. What happened? The kid, the kid pulled, got a cramp. So he got his leg and he pushed it up, you know, to help the kid because the kid was in excruciating pain and helping him. One of the parents came over to me. He goes, well, that's amazing. He said he just, you know, what? and he always does that because he does. I mean, it's, this wasn't the first time. Mary said, he's always the first one over there. I said, that's because he has a heart for the hurting. 
What I'm saying, no matter how talented or gifted we are at anything, if we don't have a heart for the hurting, come on, y'all hearing me? We missed it. Paul said it this way. If I could speak of the, with tongues and angels, if I could lay hands on the sick, if I could raise the dead, but have not love, it's worth zero, nada. So we need to be humble. And Daniel had all of these attributes, and I'm sure more. Now, the Bible says that Daniel had an excellent spirit, even though he's in his 90s, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom because of his excellent spirit. Let's read on, verse 4. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs. There's a spirit of jealousy there, y'all. Hmm? But they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him. Let me say that again. No corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the laws of his God. All right, let's move on. Could you imagine today, could you imagine today placing any politician, I don't care if they're Democrat or Republican, placing any politician under this kind of scrutiny with over 50 years of political service navigating life through a cesspool environment. Come on, how many of you know what I'm talking about here? And find nothing wrong with his brother. There was no mistress. They couldn't pull up a YouTube with a racial slur on it. There was no pay for play, no fraudulent expense account. Every dollar was accounted for. Here's a question for you. How is it possible that United States congressmen and congresswomen earn about $140,000, $150,000 a year, and just after 10 or 20 years, they're worth 50 or $60 million? How is that possible? Just saying. They know somebody. So with Daniel... There are no intern scandals, no questionable business deals, no gifts from lobbyists, no suspicious emails or texts, uh, not even an accusation from his staff. Come on, y'all hear what I'm talking about here. Simply put, there were no skeletons in Daniel's closet, none. His enemies examined his life through and through and through and found nothing to attack him so they had to try to fabricate him i'm talking about an excellent spirit come on church and give our god a hand so these government officials the other guys who are daniel's peers are jealous of him and listen to me somebody if jealousy is not dealt with it will turn into hatred it will turn into disdain. You will begin to have disdain toward a person. And it says in verse 4, it says, At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges. It says, at this. Well, at what? Because Daniel was going to be promoted and uh, be their boss, and they despised him. So they spent millions of dollars. They hired the IRS, the DOJ, the FBI, the... CIA, even some foreign spies trying to dig up some dirt on Daniel, but once again, they found nothing. <laughs> they said, we will never find anything wrong unless it has to do with his faith. Because we know how his faith is in his God, and it supersedes everything in his life. Oh, I'm talking to somebody this morning. Yeah. 
So they said, let's change the laws. Let's make it illegal to speak about certain topics. Let's make it illegal to preach out of Romans chapter 1 or 1 Corinthians chapter 6. What you talking about, Pastor? You know it's illegal in Canada right now to preach against homosexuality because it's considered hate crime. Oh, yeah. It goes deeper than that. Uh, did you get the slide? Yeah, this next slide. There it is. I, I had to put this together late last night because th this would just happen. This is a Canadian pastor. Canadian pastor defiant as a judge orders him to parrot medical experts from the pulpit. He said, I will not obey the government. Thank God there's some godly men around. What they want him to do, if you go read the article, before every sermon, they want him to give the opinion, opinion, you all hearing me, of the majority of the doctors in Canada about wearing a mask and about the vaccine and about social distancing. They're forcing him. Honey, I'm not talking about China. I'm not talking about North Korea. I'm not talking about Iran. I'm talking about our neighbor to the north, Canada, a free Western nation. Honey, listen, it's seeping its way into the United States of America. Let me go back to last week. Do you see the handwriting on the wall? Pastor Michael will be right back with today's message. If you would like to hear or watch other messages by Pastor Michael on your computer or electronic device or learn more about our ministry, please visit our website at www.judaministries.net and click on Go Beyond. Now let's get back to today's message. Verse 6. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days except you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Verse 8. Now, I'm sorry, yeah, now your majesty issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. So first of all, they said they have all agreed. First off, the politicians lied. Amen. Now, could you imagine that? A politician lying. You know, you know how you can tell when a politician lies, right? When her mouth is moving. They stated that all agreed. Daniel didn't agree. And he was one of the top three. He wasn't even aware of this new legislation. They were just going to cram it through. Does that sound familiar? Hmm? So they made an appeal to the pride of the king, King Darius, and they began to flatter him. You're the king. You're the only one that should be worshipped. If anyone should worship anyone or anything else, off to the lion's den. Of course, King Darius, not being fully informed, and the appeal to his pride was too much to resist, he issued the decree. Listen, church, politicians love power. And Darius was no different. Most politicians are drunk on power. That's why these current politicians love these mandates. No one can challenge them. They have the power. They call it emergency situations. 
Oh, listen, somebody, this is Hitler back in the 30s. It was the same scenario where they begin to take away people's rights in the name of an emergency. Oh, I hope somebody is hearing this message this morning. My, my, my. You will get a vax. You will wear a mask. You will get tested or you're going to be off to the lion's den. The United States Attorney General Merrick Garland made a statement a couple of weeks ago that parents who refused to have their children vaxxed, he called them domestic terrorists. Listen to me, somebody. Words have meanings. They're drunk on power. Is C-19 real? Absolutely it's real. But let me remind you, the survival rate of C-19 is 99.984%. And it's higher for those who are young and healthy. So why is California mandating children K-12 through to be vaccinated? See, right now in Canada, you'd be bailing me out of jail. Y'all with me? For real. It's the time we live in. They're drunk for power. Now, you've heard me say this time and time again. If it's your choice to be jabbed, so be it. Not a problem. Do it. It's, that, that does not, it's not a measurement of your faith. Come on, church. Y'all with me? That's not a measurement of your faith. But if you don't want it, you ain't making me do it. So these crooked politicians are buttering up Darius. Long time ago, I had a preacher once tell me, he said, be careful of compliments because they can be poisonous. Because they can go to your head and plant the seed of pride in your heart, making you believe that you're something that you're not. Now, honey, you would twubble. Y'all with me? So be careful when somebody is flattering you. Be careful when somebody's going overboard because there might be an ulterior motive. Psalm, or I'm sorry, Proverbs 29 and 5 says this, those who flatter their neighbors are spreading nets for their feet. That's exactly what these politicians did to Darius. They trapped him. Let's read on. Verse 10, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home. His upstairs room, where the windows opened toward Jerusalem, three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God, just as he had done before. Now remember, he's in his 90s, and Brother Daniel still has a fervent prayer life. That should put some of us to shame, y'all. Verse 11, then these men went as a group, right? Their little caucus. And they found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human being except you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered proudly and said, the decree stands with his chest puffed out. In accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So at Daniel's first hearing of this first mandate, or this new mandate, the Bible says he went home and prayed. And he prayed with his windows open. He was not ashamed of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was not a Hebrew in the closet. Come on, you all. Paul says it this way. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. As the apostles stated in Acts chapter 4, we must obey God's law over man's law. God's word states to worship him. Worship him only. God's word states to preach the word, whether it's accepted by society 
or not. God's word states to forsake not the gathering of the saints as some are in the habit of doing. How many of you know that because of this governmental mandate shutting down churches a year and a half ago, many are still in the habit of attending St. Mattress every Sunday morning? Come on, y'all. My question is for you, Mr. or Mrs. Faith Preacher, what are you waiting for? Are you waiting for King Darius to tell you it's okay? Oh, somebody needs to hear that. Listen, if you keep missing church, eventually, honey, you won't miss it any longer. Now you're in trouble. So Daniel prays, as was his habit, three times per day. First, he gives thanks to God. So let me encourage the church this morning. Whatever mandate the government passes, give thanks to to God. Get into your posture of worship. I'm trying to encourage you here, church. The Bible says then they heard, the men heard Daniel asking God for help. There's nothing wrong with asking God for help while you're in your posture of worship. The Bible says, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I will enter his courts with praise. Come on, y'all. That's the natural way into the holy place where the presence of our God abides, when Jesus Christ hung on that cross, stretched out his arms, the Bible says it is finished, and the veil was rent in two. He says, come boldly before the throne of grace. We go with thanksgiving. We go with a praise into our worship on our one-on-one -on -one time. Come on, somebody in the house of Judah, give a God a praise in here. Mm. So after they set Daniel up, these crooked politicians began to surveil Daniel. They began intercepting his emails and tapping his phone, y'all. They went to spy on him, but Daniel had nothing to hide. The Bible says he opened his windows for all to see. I don't care what your mandate is. I don't care what your edict is. Verse 13, then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles of Judah, he pays no attention to you, your majesty, or the decree that you put in writing. He's still praying three times a day. What a wicked, evil man. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and make every effort until sundown to save him. Now, King Darius wasn't angry and furious like King Nebuchadnezzar was with the three Hebrew boys. You remember when they wouldn't bow down? The Bible says Nebuchadnezzar, he was fit to be tied, right? But not, uh, not, not Darius. He was greatly distressed because he had an affection for Daniel. Remember, Daniel was in his 90s probably like a father to Darius. Daniel had an excellent spirit, and Darius knew it. He was a great asset to the kingdom. He was a great asset to the king. He was a true man of integrity. Listen, church, if we have an excellent spirit, we should be a blessing to our company, not a burden. We should be an asset, not a liability. We should be a problem solver, not the problem. Mm. Darius also now realizes that he was set up by these other conniving politicians. Verse 15, watch. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel, now a 90-year-old frail man, and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God whom you serve continually rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the 
den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring, with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Now, let me just pause there for a minute. Does that remind you of another person who was placed in a tomb with a stone? Come on, Judah, what's my two favorite words? But God. <laughs> then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating, without any entertainment being brought in. No YouTube. And he could not sleep. So Darius is upset that he was snookered. But because of the type of the decree he made, even the king, he knew he could not change the outcome. He was legally bound. In other words... You're done, Daniel. There's no escaping now. Checkmate. Uh. Let me tell you a true story. Can I have my next slide up here, please? This is a very, very famous painting. It's entitled simply Checkmate. A young chess master traveled to France back in the 1800s. It's a true story. He was to compete in a world-class chess match. Since he had a few days of leisure, leisure, he decided to visit a local museum. In the museum, they had a famous painting entitled Checkmate. As he stood there for a long time with his guide, looking and studying the painting, and his guide is thinking, why is he looking at this so long? He stared and he stared and he studied and he studied, and after a long period of time, he turned to his guide and said, my friend, that's not checkmate. The king has one more move. I'm here to tell somebody today in this world, you might, they might be crying out checkmate, but I want to tell you, the king has one more move. You might be in some financial distress and bill collectors are calling your name and they're crying out, checkmate. But I'm here to tell somebody, the king has one more move. You might be going through marital challenges. Your family's acting up and everything's going haywire and the government's saying, checkmate. But I'm here to tell somebody this morning, the king has one more Move, you may have received a bad doctor's report. They say there's no hope, and it's checkmate. I'm telling you, the king has won more. Move, even though Daniel was tossed in the lion's den, and his enemies were yelling, checkmate. I'm telling you, the king has won more. Move, somebody in the house of Judah, give our God 15 seconds of praise. Come on, somebody in your life, I'm trying to tell you the king has one more move. It's not checkmate, honey. My God. Hey, Korobo Shadala. Hallelujah. Hey. Verse 19. Ah, this is good stuff, y'all. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lions. And he couldn't sleep, y'all. He was waiting for sun to crack the sky. When he came near to the den, he called out to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God. Has your God, whom you continually, who you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lines? Wow, this would have been sweetness to his ears, huh? May the king huh, live forever. Somebody shout, my God. Sent his angel. Shut the mouths of the lions and they have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. 
nor have I ever done anything wrong before your majesty. Because of the sinless life of Jesus Christ, the grave could not hold his body down. Come on, somebody in the house. Verse 23, the king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the dead. And when Daniel was lifted from the dead, from the den, no wound was found on him. Why? Because he had trusted in his God. All right, let's wrap this up. Verse 24. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought <laughs> and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and their children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them. They were hungry. <laughs> and crushed all their bones. Now, church, let me tell you something. That's what you call true poetic justice, y'all. When King, I'm sorry, then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language and all the earth, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree. In every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues. He saves. He prefers signs. He performs wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus in Persia. Somebody in this house, give our God a great big praise because he's a delivering God. He's a healing God. He's a saving God. Hey! Caleb, can we put a slide up of the, the message title? Yeah, thank you. There's a lot of paintings about Daniel and the lions. You could look them up and you can find lots of them. This is my favorite one. Here's why. Daniel is not focused on the lions. Oh, God. I ain't looking at that cancer report. Oh, God. I'm not looking at my crazy husband. Oh, God. <laughs> Daniel knew his Redeemer. Let me wrap this up. The Bible says all things work together. For the, watch now, watch. We'll mess with your theology a little bit. It doesn't say most things. It doesn't say some things. All things. It doesn't say all things except COVID. I'm telling you, saints of God, I believe that we're not going to see the major impact that this pandem pandemic, if you will, had on this earth the fruit of the gospel of Jesus Christ that it has caused because it has pushed ministries not only like ours but all over the globe to begin preaching throughout the internet. Do you all hear what I'm saying? Somebody say all things. All things, including C-19, work together for the good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Come on, you got to read that whole passage. 
Because I mean, there's a whole lot of folk in ministry that aren't called and they don't love God. But it has caused an explosion of souls being saved around the earth. Our God will be glorified. However it will be, listen, on his terms. Not some government's terms. He was glorified through Pharaoh. He was glorified through King Nebuchadnezzar. He was glorified through Darius. He was glorified through Caesar, even in the crucifixion and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was glorified through Hitler. It caused the rebirth of the nation of Israel. Somebody get this this morning. Our God will be glorified. And he will be glorified through the Antichrist when our Lord Jesus Christ and returns and slays him with the sword of his mouth, which is the word of God. I wish somebody in this house would give our King Jesus a praise in here. I feel like running. Our God reigns forevermore. I don't care what kind of lion's den you might be in today. Turn your focus on Jesus. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Don't look for a government bailout. He's not called Jehovah Jireh for nothing. He's our provider. He's our healer. He's our shalom, our peace. Come on, y'all. Oh, we serve a mighty God. Oh, we serve a mighty God. To proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ To every nation, every generation To all creation to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ